Okay, so I think we're going to get started. So first of all, lecture four, what controls the planet's temperature? So really on Wednesday we focused on the solar system and Earth's formation in context with some of these other um, planets in our solar system. And in particular we thought about how sort of what's specific about Earth makes it so habitable, what makes it so perfect for life to have developed and exist. Um, and then as a reminder, we have quiz one, so the first assignment for the class. It's going to be available from 2 p.m. today until 1 p.m. on Monday. It's going to cover the three lectures from this week, so I do want to try and get through today's stuff. Okay, so here's the brief instructions. Um, the quizzes are multiple choice. A couple of them will be really easy. A couple of them really won't be, okay? Um, so it's a challenge. And the reason that I ask the questions I do is because I think those are the important things that I would like you to understand. And it's important for you to realize whether you understand them now rather than after the first midterm. So please do take the time to look at it properly and think about what you understand and you don't. Um, you have three chances to complete the quiz and there's no time limit. So you have access to your books and everything else, which is why the, ch the questions are a bit more challenging. Um, but please don't submit any more than three. I can't set up a limit. The, the program won't let me do that. So, but if you submit more than three, I have to go and manually put together everyone's scores, and it takes me hours and hours. So I will penalize you if you submit the quiz more than three times. Um, you have to take eight of the ten quizzes over the quarter, but I encourage you to take all of them. It gives you a chance to work out what you know um, and more chances to get a good score, right? So you've got nothing to lose in that respect. Um, to find the quiz, you can go into Triple E and look under quizzes, my quizzes, something like that. Um, you'll also get an email with a link to it. Okay? Um, and then as a quick reminder, if you haven't filled in the other sort of one question quiz that's on there for the class, which is the UCI video waiver form, then please do fill that in as well so we can uh, put the, the videos online properly. Okay. So, as an outline, we're going to quickly spend two or three minutes finishing off last lecture, and then we're going to move on to uh, the topic of today, which is what is it that controls Earth's temperature? What is it, what sort of combination of factors combine to create our energy balance? Okay. So, this is what we got to on Wednesday, that we have these fundamental things that are necessary for life to exist. First of all, we need the right combination of elements. So carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, things like that, that were created in previous suns and stars um, and formed our solar nebula, which we created our planets from. Most importantly of all, we need a source of energy. And whether that energy is from the sun, uh, which we'll talk more about today, or whether a small fraction of it can be from sort of geothermal energy from the interior of the Earth. The presence of liquid water, which is related to point two. Liquid water is sort of necessary for a lot of the chemical reactions that uh, allow us to exist in, in the current form. And then suitable environmental conditions, so a vast collection of other things that happen to coincide to create stable enough conditions for life to have developed and survived and got to this point, which is intelligent life. And this was the point we reached on Wednesday, which is that we talked very much about the possibilities of our solar system, things like Europa um, and Cedulus and Mars and Venus. But actually, if we look outside our solar system, for the first time in the past sort of two, three years, we've been able to identify pretty Earth-like planets. So these are the, the ones that are closest to, to Earth right now in terms of similarity. And you can see that they're pretty close in size, they're a little bit bigger just because the bigger planets are easier to detect. Um, but they're also orbiting within reasonable distances from the stars. And so our, our odds of finding Earth-like planets where life could potentially evolve has greatly increased. Um, and we use what we call the Drake equation to try and put rough numbers on this. And this is very rough numbers. So the number of civilizations in our galaxy with whom we could communicate, so we're going for the gold here, we're not going for like just single celled stuff, is related to the rate of suitable star formation. So remember our sun is pretty common as a star. It's nice and long lived. 
So we're not looking for really short-lived stars. And we maybe have seven new stars per year that could, could have Earth-like sort of planets and life. Then what fraction of those stars actually have planets? Terrestrial planets where we could develop life? Uh, at least 5%. This is what we're starting to find out. That number could increase potentially. Um, the number of Earth-like planets... And that was something that we really didn't know until a couple of years ago, until we got this new telescope which could detect uh, these smaller planets. And that's why we have an enormous range of possibility there. We have somewhere between, oh, we just don't know, maybe 0.005% up to maybe 20%. And if you project that into just our galaxy, the Milky Way, that could potentially mean 17 billion Earth-like planets. So the numbers are going up a bit. And then we get into stuff that, oh, well, it's a bit dodgy. OK, fraction of the above planets that develop life, that's the really big question. And that's why we're looking at places like Mars. And we're really interested, because if Mars developed life independently, then the odds go way up that life could develop on these other planets as well. Of those that develop life, how many go on to develop intelligent life? How many of them get to sort of our stage? And how many of them develop civilizations with technology that could release detectable signals to space, like our radio waves, which are traveling out from the Earth, which would be detectable elsewhere? And then we also have to include the, amount, the length of time that such civilizations exist. We're not going to be around forever. That's reality. So how long will we, we be around, and how long will we continue to release these signals? And if you plug in rough numbers. I don't really know how they get at numbers for the last sort of few factors. We get anything from two to 5,000 for our Milky Way. And obviously that's pretty hypothetical. But it raises the interesting possibility that there could be something. And so it's a really interesting question. And that's just our galaxy. OK? And this is our galaxy, the Milky Way. And if you ever wondered where you are in the Milky Way, that's where you are. OK, that's our sun. We're on one of the outer arms. Um, but it's not just our galaxy. This is what happens if you point the Hubble telescope at what looks like an empty area of space. So in this sort of portion, we sort of zoomed in in an area where there weren't stars sort of visible from the Milky Way. And this is what we get. All of these points of light are galaxies. They're other galaxies. We have potentially 125 billion other galaxies in the universe. Just the scale of this is immense. Okay? So my question for you is, we don't know the answer, but what do you think? Do you think there could be life elsewhere in the universe? Do you think there could be intelligent life? Do you think there could just be simple life? Do you think we're just unique, or do you just not want to vote? Okay. Okay, a few more seconds for people to dig out their eye clickers. Okay, so let's take a look. Ooh, 50%. It's interesting. We might never know, but I think it's, it's so much fun to really think about this and imagine. Um, I love that stuff about science. Okay, so... That's the, the fun, exciting stuff from last lecture. But let's think today more carefully about the Earth, because there's actually really amazing things about the Earth as well. Um, and it's related to that sort of development of life and, and this development of intelligent life, which is that, do you remember I said that our sun is pretty boring? It's run of the mill. But as it ages, it's actually been getting brighter, which is the reverse of what we would sort of intuitively think. Um, so the luminosity, the output of the sun, has been increasing over its history, and it will continue to increase. So if we go back 4.5 billion years ago to the early Earth when it first formed, the sun was 30% less bright than it is today. And that's a very considerable number. That's not just a couple of degrees or something. That's a very substantial difference. But if we look at the geological evidence, we can see with maybe, I mean, even with the snowball earth, there was liquid water underneath. We can find liquid water for the whole history of the earth. And so it's difficult for us to sort of reconcile those two things. It's a paradox. 
So what explains the fact that it should have been much colder on Earth, but it wasn't? Um, and so that's the question of the day that we're going to work towards. What are the different factors that control Earth's temperature? What might have changed through time that has allowed us to keep this amazingly stable temperature throughout the whole history of the Earth? So the first factor we have to consider is the sun. This is where we're getting our energy from. And we call the power output of the sun luminosity. Um, and so the luminosity of the sun right now is 3.865 times 10 to the 26 watts. What's your average light bulb that you get from Ikea? 15 right now, when I was a child, a long time ago. It was 60 watts, but we're getting better, OK? So it's this many watts. It's a lot of watts. What's a watt? It's a measure of how much energy the sun is emitting per second. Okay? So one watt is equal to one joule, which is one of those units of energy, J-O-U-L-E, joule, um, per second. So one watt equals one joule per second. And you'll have a chance to practice using these units in the discussions next week. Okay. So... I wanted to introduce a little bit more about the sun because there's a couple of things that are going to be important for later parts of this lecture. So I want to introduce this idea of a black body. Okay? And this is something that physics came up with um, in order to allow us to create certain laws uh, which predict the behavior of things that emit radiation. So a black body is it's a hypothetical thing. It's nothing behaves perfectly like a black body. But it is, absorbs all of the light shined upon it. And then, most importantly for us today, it emits a spectrum of light that depends on its temperature. OK? So it emits a spectrum of light that depends on its temperature. And we can treat the sun like a black body. It behaves close enough that we can really do that. So I've used this word a few times, this word spectrum. What do I mean when I say spectrum? What I mean is that the light and the energy that comes towards us from the sun isn't in one particular wavelength. It doesn't all arrive as yellow light with the wavelength 400 and something. It actually is a range. And we know this because we have to put on sunscreen to block the UV. Um, and we know that we get visible light from the sun so we can see it. Okay. Um, so this is what the sun produces. It pr produces a certain amount of radiation in a number of different wavelengths. Okay, phone's off. If it goes off again, I'll, I'll answer it. Okay, so, oh, it's got a bit offset. But the idea is, is that because we can view the sun as a black body, we can use a couple of the laws um, that govern its behavior to make predictions. Okay, and in particular, I want to introduce you to two laws in um, the first is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. And remember, a law is something that we're really certain about, where the amount of radiation something emits is related to the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is up there, times the temperature of whatever is emitting it to the power 4. So you can imagine that even if temperature increases a little bit, the amount of radiation that something emits will go up a lot more. Okay, that's what the power for effectively means. And temperature here is not measured in Fahrenheit. Um, I have a thing about Fahrenheit, and someone didn't like me in my reviews last quarter. They told me off for having a go at Fahrenheit all the time. But it is a silly scale. And instead, most, <laughs> most people use Celsius in science. It's a much more sensible scale. Water freezes at zero, boils at 100. Um, but a lot of the physics that we're going to be using uh, uses Kelvin, which is just another temperature scale. And what that sort of starts at is it starts at zero for absolute zero. So if we slowed or if we removed all energy from a system, so even the, the molecules stopped vibrating backwards and forwards, that would be absolute zero. And that's about minus 273.16 degrees Celsius, minus a lot more Fahrenheit. Okay, so when I say Kelvin and I use a big number, um, I don't necessarily, it's not that we're at hundreds of degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit, it's just that that scale starts a lot lower off. Okay, 
So we often think of the average temperature of the Earth at about 300 Kelvin. It's a nice round number. It's easy to remember. Okay. So if we go back, you can see that whenever we use temperature in these equations, we use Kelvin. And it's nothing scary. It's just a different scale. And then the second law that I want to introduce you to is Vine's law. And it says that, do you remember we looked at that spectrum from the sun? And although it emits a, a, lo a, long, a, a large number of different wavelengths, there is actually a peak there. It produces its peak wavelength in that sort of bluish color. That particular wavelength is its peak uh, wavelength of emission. Okay? And we have a law that tells us what that should be. And again, it's related to temperature. And that maximum wavelength of emission is 2,898 divided by the temperature. And what that should tell you, because I'm sure all of you are thinking this in your head, really, is that as temperature goes up, what happens to the wavelength? It goes down. So as temperature goes up, we're dividing by a bigger number, that wavelength will go down. So what that means is that the hotter an object is, the, the shorter the wavelength it produces. Okay. And we can look at that in a graph form as well. And you can see my question already. But what we can do is we can look at these curves like the one I showed you before and said, well, if wavelengths along the bottom axis going from smaller on the left-hand side to longer on the right-hand side, and we've got increasing amount of radiation up at the side, then we can say that the total amount of radiation produced, which is our Stefan Boltzmann law, is that area under the curve. Okay? So the bigger the temperature, the bigger the area under the curve. And then we have our Vines law, our second law, which says that the wavelength of maximum emission, the peak of that curve, is going to be lower for warmer temperatures. Okay? Everyone's looking a bit terrified. So think about those two things. Talk with your neighbors and answer me this. What is the wavelength of maximum emission of the second coldest body? So you've got five different spectrums there produced by five different bodies at different temperatures. What's the wavelength of the second coldest one? What's the peak wavelength? <coughs> See if you can find someone from the atmosphere class, because they should remember this. Okay, I think we've got most people, so if you haven't voted, put your, put your estimate down. Okay, so let's see if we have even vague consensus. Ooh, well done. It's Friday and everyone's brain is working. Okay, so B is the right answer, and for those people that didn't get it, I just want to walk through what that is. So. If we say that the energy under the curve, the, the warmer something is, the more area under the curve that there is, what's the warmest body on here? A, absolutely. A has got the biggest sort of outgoing flux of energy, and it's got the biggest area under its curve. So what's the second coldest curve on that? D, absolutely. And if you look at where the peak of that curve is, that spectrum, of D, I can't do it because I'm too short, but it roughly lines up with this 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Does that make sense now for the people that perhaps weren't following? <laughs> 
hopefully. If not, then your TAs would be happy to answer questions in discussion, and I'm always happy to go through things again. There's also stuff that is uh, within your textbook in chapter two, I think it is. Okay, so remember I showed you this last week. Okay? And remember that the hotter the body, the lower the wavelength it produces. So this end would be the hot side, and this end would be the cold side. So the peak energy produced by the sun is actually in the visible wavelengths. Okay? And we'll come back to this in a little while. Because I want to introduce you to this idea that what emits radiation, we think of it as just hot things. We think of it as the sun is emitting radiation, or perhaps hot coals at a bonfire or something. But everything above absolute zero, everything above zero Kelvin, emits radiation. If it's really, really cold, it may not emit a lot, but it still emits something. Okay? So you can look suspiciously at the person next to you because they're also emitting radiation, as are you. Does anyone know what type of wavelength we emit? Infrared, absolutely. Okay, infrared. And why is this important to know? Okay, I always tell this to my classes just in case. Because if exams become too hard and you decide to turn to a life of crime, you need to know that you emit infrared radiation. Because we use it in this sort of type of thing. So, you know when you see police helicopters and they have that thermal imaging going? Usually that's at night, right, because it's too dark to see a person. But what we can pick up is that that person is warmer than the surrounding area. And so that person is emitting radiation at a different wavelength to the rest of the Earth. And if you have the cameras that can pick up those different wavelengths, just like our visible cameras can pick up different wavelengths, then you can actually work out where that person is. Okay? The other slightly illegal or sort of way that you or the way that you can catch illegal activity, this is from England. Okay. In England, there are some very bad people that grow cannabis. And uh, in England you can't do that outside, it's way too cold. And so what they do is they grow it in houses. And uh, to grow cannabis, apparently you need much warmer conditions and you need nice sort of moist conditions. And that takes a lot of energy and you need to heat your house up. And so what you can see is that on this street, the police have gone past with their thermal camera and they can see that this particular house is way hotter than all of the other ones on the street. And so they were able to find out that they were growing cannabis in the the loft of that house, okay? So there's all sorts of really useful ways. This is just sort of the, 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 sort of the silly stuff, but we use it in a number of different ways, um, and it's sort of night vision and everything else. It's very cool. Okay, so back to the serious stuff. So we have this solar luminosity. I already said that our solar luminosity over billions of years has been steadily increasing. But we also see much sort of shorter time scale variability. Um, and in particular, if you've ever heard of the sunspot cycle, which is every, every 11 years or so, then we do see uh, a very small change, a tiny, tiny change in the solar luminosity associated with that. Um, and it's one of the interesting questions that we seem to see a bigger signal in our climate that we would expect. And so a lot of research is going in to see sort of what could be amplifying this tiny change in solar luminosity in our climate system. Um, and we have a really good idea of the sunspot cycle because we had a lot of monks in Italy and other places in Europe that seemed to have nothing better to do than count the number of sunspots for a very, very long time. But that's very, very helpful for us. It allows us to see that it's not just that 11-year time scale either. You can see that there's longer variation as well. Um, but we still really can't explain that. We can't predict it. So it's an interesting question. OK, the other thing that doesn't really change ever. In terms of our billions of years, this hasn't changed. Yes? What are sunspots? Oh, sorry, sunspots. Yes, so if you look at the sun, we've been in a really low period, so people might not have seen them. If you look at the sun, sometimes little dark spots appear on that. I mean, it's actually related to increased solar activity, um, which is weird. Um, but yes. There's some really cool stuff online, and they're associated with big geomagnetic storms and increased auroras and things like that as well. So, yeah. Okay. 
So this is sort of combines with our luminosity, our distance from the sun combines with that to create what we call the solar constant. Okay, so here's our orbit around the sun. It's not perfectly circular. It's ever so slightly elliptical, but it's not elliptical enough to make a really huge difference. It's not the reasons that we have the reason that we have seasons. Okay? So today, on July 4th, our summer, we're actually slightly further away from the sun, and in our winter, we're actually slightly closer to the sun. And we'll come back to this when we talk about the atmosphere and seasons in particular. But for now, we, uh, we use these two things to work out the solar constant. Okay, so a little bit more math, I'm really hammering the math today. Okay, so the solar constant can also be called the solar flux density. And really, it's just a measure of how spread out that radiation from the sun is. So if I had a light bulb here, and I had a small box around it, the interior of that little box would be really bright, because that energy isn't very spread out. If I had a light bulb, and it had to fill this, had to sort of, that, that radiation had to spread out and fill this entire auditorium, then you can imagine that the light that hits the walls will be a lot more spread out and will be less dense than the light that hits there. Okay? It's not because it's fading away as it travels, it's just it's becoming much more spread out. And it's the same for the planets. So you can take, basically you can draw a sphere around the sun and use the, the radius, the distance of a planet from the sun to work out how much energy that, that particular planet will get. So, if we put our numbers in, so the luminosity of our sun, and I've rounded it up to make it easier, is about 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts. The area of a sphere, you all remember, is 4 pi r squared. And in this case, the r, the radius that we're using, is the distance from the Earth to the sun. And if we plug in those numbers, then what we get is that for every square meter on Earth, we get about 1,367 watts of that total output of the sun. Does that make sense, or do you want me to go through it one more time? No one's, no one's looking too horrified. Okay, so let's see if uh, people got this. So if we think about what the solar constant of Mars would be, would it be greater than Earth's? Would it be less than the Earth's? Or would it be the same as the Earth? So think about what's changing in that formula and the effect that that would have on the solar flux density, on our solar constant. And Mars is further away, just in case people can't remember. Okay, a few more seconds for the last votes. Okay. So, 69, pretty good, even better than last time. So yeah, you are right, it's less than the Earth. So let's think about why that is. Okay, first of all, logically, Mars is further away from the Sun. Do you think it gets more radiation than us or less radiation than us? Less, okay. So now let's use the math to prove that, okay. So, do you remember we said that the solar flux density is the luminosity? Is that different between the Earth and Mars? No, because it's still the same, it's still the solar luminosity of the Sun. But now we have to calculate the area of the sphere. And before we used the radius of the Earth from the Sun, and now we're gonna use the radius of Mars from the Sun. And Mars is further away, so that R, is greater, okay? So if we're dividing the luminosity by a larger number, then we're gonna get less. Yes? Yes? yes. Hopefully. Okay. If you ever want me to go over anything again, then please do raise your hand and wave at me. Okay? Nope. Okay.
So we've created our solar constant for the Earth. Um, and so we can take that 1,367 watts per square meter. That's what's arriving at the Earth's sort of outer boundary. Okay? But what happens is that it has to travel through the atmosphere. And so we don't necessarily see at the ground all of that 1,367 watts per square meter. Stuff happens to it in between. And so if you look at the solar spectrum, that top orange curve there shows what we would measure if we had a satellite, which we do, above Earth's atmosphere. That's what it would measure. That's the solar spectrum it would measure. The, the sort of filled in colors there are actually what we measured down here at sea level. And you can see that, first of all, we've just chopped off about half of it anyway. Okay? But also, you can see that there's funny gaps. There's funny missing gaps. Does anyone from the atmosphere class remember what is creating these little gaps? It's a whole six months ago. That, that, that bodes well, doesn't it? OK. Those little gaps are to do with the gases in the atmosphere. Certain of our gases in the atmosphere absorb certain wavelengths of light. And we're going to come back to this idea when we talk about the greenhouse effect. Guys, can you just be quiet, please? So those little gaps there are related to specific gases. And in particular, water vapor is a huge one. The presence of water vapor in the atmosphere means that a lot of the infrared incoming radiation gets absorbed. Okay, So that's why we see little gaps there. So what happens to the rest of it? Why do we see this decrease between the top of the atmosphere and the base? Well, first of all, some of it just gets reflected. We have these nice reflective things called clouds. Um, and when there are clouds, which isn't often around here, but when there are clouds, a certain amount of that incoming radiation gets reflected back, which is why it's colder on a cloudy day. Okay? Um, and so a certain amount is reflected by clouds. A certain amount is reflected from the ground. You can imagine that different ground surfaces uh, have different reflectivities. Um, and then some of it's scattered by the atmosphere. And when I say scattered, what I mean is instead of just being reflected straight out, like into a, when you look at a mirror, scattering is when you look at something that isn't quite so polished. And you can sort of vaguely see an image, but it's not quite there. In, instead of the light coming in and bouncing straight out, it tends to go off in all directions. Okay? And so some of that scattered radiation goes out to space again. So some of it is scattered out to space. And then the rest of it is absorbed either by gases in the atmosphere or by the Earth's surface itself. So if you add it up, what percentage is absorbed by the atmosphere and the Earth? What percentage is absorbed? 70, 70%. So what percentage, therefore, is reflected? 30%. OK, really complicated maths. So that 30%, that fraction that is reflected away, we have a specific word for it. It's called the albedo, which is a really strange word. But all that basically means is the fraction of light that is reflected out to space. So that, that percentage doesn't come into, oh, let me say that again. So of that 1,367 watts per meter squared coming in, 30% of that gets reflected back and has nothing to do with warming up the Earth. OK. So our planetary albedo is at that 30%. That's the 30% that's reflected back to space. So can you think of ways in which we could change the Earth's albedo? So what were we saying was nice and white and reflective? Clouds. Do we always have the same number of clouds? No. So we could change the amount of light reflected away by changing the amount of clouds. What else is really nice and white and reflective that we don't often see in South California? Snow. Snow. OK. What do you think happens to the northern hemisphere in winter? It gets covered in snow. So do you think we reflect away more or less? Or, so what would our albedo be? Would the albedo be higher or less? Higher. You've got it. Great. OK. So prove to me you've really got it. 
So this is a, a table with lots of different types of, of surface. So we've got clouds, we've got snow, we've got desert sand, we've got sort of ocean water. And you can see the percentage there. Okay? And remember that the average percentage of the Earth is 30%. So look at these three things, an increase in snow cover, a decrease in cloud cover, or an increase in the area of forests. And there's going to be a question just like this on your quiz this week, so make sure you get it. Uh, I know. Top tip. So, see if you can work out which of those things would increase the, the albedo. Okay? And once you've worked out which one will increase, work out why the others would decrease. <coughs> Okay, we've got most answers, so if you haven't voted... Any more votes? No? Nope. Okay. So let's see. It's a nice, easy question, really, I think. Yes. Top one of the day. It's amazing what an incentive like quizzes will, will do, right? Okay. So you're absolutely right that if we increase the snow cover, if we increase the area of Earth that's covered by nice white reflective areas, then we're going to increase the albedo. We're going to increase the amount of sun reflected back to space. What would that do to temperatures? Decrease them, right? If we're reflecting more and absorbing less, then we're going to get colder. Okay? So... Let's look at one of the other ones for a second. So increasing the area of forests. So let's look. Forests have an albedo of 5 to 20%. Is that more or less than our average today? Less. Okay. So in that case, we'd be reflecting less and absorbing more. Okay. So if we increase the area of forests, then more or less anything else is more reflective than that. So if we increase forests, then the only other thing that will absorb more than forest is water, and presumably we're not growing forest area over the ocean. So we must be growing that forested area over maybe soils or tundra or desert sands, and so we're replacing that more reflective surface with something that's less reflective. Okay, so in that case, we'd be lowering the albedo, and what would that do to temperature? Increase, because we're absorbing more and reflecting less. Okay, great. Well done, guys. Okay. So I said that the Earth is reflecting away that 30% and absorbing 70%. So why aren't we getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter if we're absorbing 70% of that incoming radiation every second? Why don't we boil off our oceans and melt away? Okay? It's because we have a temperature. And remember, anything with a temperature, anything above zero degrees Kelvin, also emits radiation. And what happens is that we form a balance. We emit the same amount of radiation out to space as what we receive. Okay? So the solar energy absorbed by the Earth, so not including the reflected stuff, the solar energy absorbed by the Earth goes into increasing our temperature, but as our temperature increases, we radiate more out to space. And so we form this balance. The, the energy absorbed by the Earth is equal to the terrestrial energy emitted. Okay? And so that's our first law, our Stefan Boltzmann law, if you remember that uh, as we increase the temperature, we increase the amount. So even if we change maybe the amount of solar energy absorbed, 
The Earth's temperature would therefore change, and therefore the amount of energy we emit will therefore change. So we always find this balance. Okay. And remember, we have our first law. What's our second law? Vine's law. And that tells us what sort of wavelengths we're most likely to emit. Okay. And remember what type of uh, radiation we emit? Infrared. So we emit infrared as people, but the Earth in general is also in the temperature range which emits infrared radiation. Okay. So if we plug in the numbers, we can see that the sun's <coughs> sort of peak wavelength of emission is around 0.483 micrometers. And for those of you that haven't encountered that sort of unit before, a micrometer is one millionth of a meter. So a meter is like this. And then you get a millimeter, which is one thousandth of a meter. And then a micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter. So it's one millionth of a millimeter. Okay? And we call this shortwave radiation. It's in the visible wavelength range. We call it shortwave. If we look at the Earth, then we can see that our temperature is much cooler than the sun. It's 300 Kelvin or so. And actually, if we plug in that number, then we get something like 9.66 micrometers. And we call that long wave radiation. Okay? So sun's energy is short wave radiation because it's hotter. The Earth's is long wave radiation because it's, because it's cooler. I'm sorry, the microphone keeps cutting in and out. Okay. So why is this important? Because the last thing that we need to consider is the greenhouse effect. Okay? And so we're going to talk a bunch about this uh, right now. Okay. And this is a horribly complicated looking diagram, but once you get it, it makes a lot of sense. So I do encourage you to, to pay attention for the next two minutes. Okay? So in my diagram here, we've got wavelengths along the bottom, but actually it's flipped from what we saw before. So the shorter wavelengths are now on this side, which is that ultraviolet light, UV. And remember, that's the damaging stuff. It's the high energy stuff we want to protect ourselves from. So we've got shorter wavelengths. And then this way, we go through a little band of visible. This is our visible wavelengths here. And then beyond that little blue line, we have infrared wavelengths. Okay? If we look up the side, we have lots of different colors. If you look at the top, orange, green, red, so sort of gray and blue, then those represent different gases. And they're all gases that we think of when we think of global warming, climate change, the greenhouse effect. So things like carbon dioxide, um, methane, not so much ozone and oxygen. Um, but water vapor is actually by far the most important greenhouse gas. We need it because we want it to rain and things like that. It's part of the hydrologic cycle. But it's by far the most important greenhouse gas. OK. And you see that the colored regions on that graph there so, for example, if we look at water vapor, anywhere that you can see colored areas, like here, this is equivalent to the, the, wavelength, the wavelength that water vapor will absorb. Okay? So, any incoming radiation, or outgoing radiation rather, because we're in the infrared now, which falls between these wavelengths, water vapor will absorb. So, instead of that outgoing radiation emitted by the Earth escaping to space, it's absorbed. Okay? And then if we look at methane, you can see that this particular wavelength, methane will absorb, and this particular wavelength. Okay? Um, you can see that oxygen and ozone, it's not so important in the infrared, but it absorbs nearly all of the incoming ultraviolet. And that's why our ozone layer is so important, because we need that to absorb that really harmful, high energy ultraviolet radiation. So why am I telling you this? Why is it important? Because look at that really narrow band of visible radiation. Okay? So this is the equivalent of this little band here. Do many of those gases absorb energy at that wavelength? Not really. Okay? You can see the sort of flat lines in most of those. So very little of the incoming radiation, that visible shortwave radiation coming from the sun, is absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. It's basically, it travels straight through. It's transmitted by the atmosphere. But what type of radiation does the Earth emit? Ultraviolet. 
infrared, long wave radiation. If we look at what different wavelengths the atmosphere will absorb in the infrared part of the spectrum, you can see that we have a lot of gases that are really good at absorbing those infrared wavelengths. And so what's happening is that the Earth is trying to emit this infrared energy out to space, but instead that energy is getting caught, it's being absorbed by those gases and it's being kept close to, to the Earth. Does that make sense? Hopefully, does anyone want me to go through that again? Okay, good. So, the sun's peak wavelength is visible. That visible light will come straight through. It will be absorbed by the ground surface and that the Earth then emits infrared energy which tries to escape out to space. But a huge amount of that is instead absorbed by the atmosphere. And this is our problem with climate change is that we're putting more methane, we're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and so it's trapping more of that outgoing infrared radiation. Okay? So this is the greenhouse effect, this is the analogy that people use. People seem to think therefore that the atmosphere is like a, a window pane, it's not necessarily true but it's a useful analogy. We think of the sun's shortwave radiations coming into the greenhouse, being absorbed by the, the surfaces, then that, that energy is re-emitted as infrared and it can't travel through those window panes. Those window panes are acting like the Earth's sort of atmosphere containing those greenhouse gases. Okay. Is the greenhouse effect a bad thing? I heard a definite no over here and the definite no is right because it's important that we have a certain amount of the greenhouse effect. Because if we didn't have any greenhouse effect at all, our temperature would be about minus 18 degrees Celsius or zero Fahrenheit. That would be the average temperature of the Earth. Would you want to live on a planet that's average temperature was at about zero Fahrenheit? No. Could we live on a planet like that? Probably not, because we would need to grow food and things and that would be difficult. With our greenhouse effect, our average temperature is a lovely, comfortable plus 15 degrees Celsius or so, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So it is important that we have a greenhouse effect. We want a certain amount of the greenhouse effect. What we don't want is the little extras. It's the extra stuff that we're adding now, which is increasing the greenhouse effect. That's the climate change portion that we don't want. The greenhouse effect as a whole is something very different from climate change. Okay? So a more familiar analogy, this is why your car heats up in the parking lots on a really sunny day. Okay? It's exactly the same process. We have the incoming visible radiation, comes through your windows, is absorbed by your nice black seats, and then it's re-radiated out as infrared which can't get through your windows. So this is why your, your car heats up on a, a lovely hot day. Okay, so we come back to our faint young sun paradox. So over that 4.5 billion years, we've been getting, or the sun has been getting more luminous, we've been getting more radiation, so we should have been really, really cold back 4.5 billion years ago. But we weren't. What thing have we just talked about that might have made the difference, what might have kept us a lot warmer early in Earth's history? Greenhouse the greenhouse effect. Okay, and in particular, do we want more of a greenhouse effect or less of a greenhouse effect? More. And what might have meant that there was more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere in the past? What didn't we have 4.5 billion years ago that we have today? Plants, life, okay. Our atmosphere was created by volcanoes and more or less all the gases coming out of volcanoes are carbon dioxide and water vapour. So it formed a really strong greenhouse effect and as life evolved and, ha and has it sort of effect on Earth, we've been getting slightly less and less and less and less and less carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And it happens to have coincided and kept our, our temperature wonderfully stable and I think that's so cool. It's a really amazing effect, okay? So here's a quick summary. Look at the incoming. We've got 100 incoming, 30% of which is immediately reflected away. And then we're emitting 70%. So that's the important thing to remember, that the incoming equals 100, the outgoing equals 100, 
What happens underneath that atmosphere is the more complicated stuff. Okay, thank you very much, guys. I'll see you on Monday.